Bionicle Adventures 10, Time Trap, written by Greg Farsty, recording by Tributron, Chapter 9. Toa Vakama was about to die. His flight pack was so badly damaged that he would not even function as a Kanoka disc launcher anymore. He was spiraling out of control, headed for the pile of rubble that used to be the Ta Metro Great Furnace. There wasn't so much as a puddle of water down below that he could aim for. His only consolation was that the mask of time would be smashed beyond repair by the fall. He was just realizing why that would be a very bad thing, even worse than his dying. When the ground started to shift underneath him, all of a sudden it did not look like pavement and stone below but more like a nest of snakes that have been disturbed. No, that wasn't right either. Those things writhing below him weren't greenish-black serpents. They were vines. This is impossible, Vakama thought. Another Makuda's tricks. The Mubazak plant is gone. We killed it in the Great Furnace. Then there was no more time for questions. He crashed to the ground but without the shattering impact he expected. Instead, the vines had formed a bed of swords underneath him. As he struggled to recover his senses, they wrapped around him and dragged him down below the street. Vakama's eyes were taking too long to adjust to the darkness. He summoned a small jet of flame from his hand to light the surrounding area, only to have the vine around his wrist yank hard no fire a voice whispered vakama knew that voice laden as it was with the feeling of death and decay it was a voice he had never thought to hear again kazani he breathed the vines released him and slithered away now he could see the dark mass in the corner looking like a monstrous half-dead tree the Kurzani had been Makuda's first attempt to create a plant creature, but the result had been a being too willful and stubborn to serve Makuda's ends. The Master of Shadows had exiled it from Metronui, where the Toa Metru first encountered it some time later. The Kurzani had blackmailed the Toa into retrieving a vial of energized protodermis for itself and then died when that substance caused the plant to burn up from within. Later, the Toa used parts of the plant creature to keep their boat buoyant on the return trip to Mechunui. You're dead, said Vakama. This is another illusion. I have had enough of Makuda's madness. As have I, the Karzani whispered. But I am very much alive. I am the mirror and the green. I do not die as flesh dies. I don't understand. When you submerged palms of my former self in the liquid protodermis of the sea, a tiny shoot grew from within. In time, that tiny piece of plant matter grew into a new Kazani. With the memories and the intelligence of the old, I am reborn. The Karzani obviously expected some momentous emotional reaction from Vakama. But the Toa had been through so much the last few days. All he could manage was a flat, good for you. What are you doing here? Not everything. Song before was an illusion, the Kurzani replied. Makuda and I achieved a truce, and I agree in the play at being a Morbazak to make his false world more convincing. But now he is coming for you, Toa. And you have none the power to defeat him. You need an ally. Thanks anyway, 
Vakama replied acidly. I've had one ally too many this trip. Unless you have some awesome toe tool hidden in all that foliage, I don't see. I have the ultimate weapon against Maguta. The Karzadi said, vines wrestling and slithering about the chamber. The truth. One of the vines reached up and tore a chunk of rubble loose. Vakama looked up and saw the sky above Mechinuya blaze with stars. You cannot find him, Vakama, because you believe you were not meant to be a Tua. The Garzani continued. Makuta looked up the stars and saw that Nuri, Akmu, and the rest were to be Tua Metru. And so he convinced Joeli Khan to empower things on the Matorn. He wanted you and your contentious friends to be the new Toa. That is what you have been told, is it not? Vakama nodded. And it is all the truth, the Karzani said. It happened just like that. Still, so did I, Toa, and that lie brought you into being. Who? asked Vakama, intrigued in spite of himself. Makuta? Likan? Another vine moved, winding its way slowly upward. Vakama watched as it pointed up to the sky. The stars, Garzani said softly. The stars align. They told Makuta that Akbu should be to a stone, with Zola to a water, and so on. And he believed them. In an attempt to alter destiny, he planted your name and the names of your friends in the Khan's mind. So you would become to a metru. But have you never wondered, Bahama, who planted your names in Makuta's mind? Bahama's head was spinning. If what the Kursani said was true, then Nuri, Akmu, and the others had never been meant to be Toa. The message in the stars had been false. It had all been a trick played on Makuta. But who would have the power to alter the path of the stars except... Mata Nui! Makama said stunned. The Great Spirit, Garzani replied. The Great Spirit who had been struck down by Makuta's treachery. I knew that his only hope of recovery was to get the Matorn out of this city before it was too late. To do that, he needed to admit you, but he knew Makuta was watching the stars. The Master's shadows would do anything to prevent those new Toa from coming into being. It was all becoming clear to Vakama now. So Matanui deceived him. He made the stars name six other Matoran to be Toa, and so Makuta would never allow them to be given power. And then he planted in Makuta's mind the names of six who truly were intended by destiny to be Toa. The Karzani chuckled, a sickening sound. Believing himself to be thwarting Martin Dewey's will, Lakota turned around and used his power to influence Nagan into making you and your friends Tormetru, the very Matoran Martin Dewey had wished to be heroes all along. The Grain Spirit knew. There was only one way to make sure the Sphinx, destined for greatness, would have the chance to be to a metric. 
And that was the drink. Makuta into making it happen himself. Vakama sat down on the stone floor, still trying to accept what he had just learned. All his life he had heard of the glory of Matanui, and how he was responsible for the sun that shone, and the breezes that blew, and all the gifts nature had given the Matoran. But in all that time, he had never heard of the great spirit intervening directly to make things right. Now, more than ever, he realized what a crime it had been that Makuta had cast Matinui into an unending sleep. Wait, said the Toa Fire, wait a moment. I saw a Toa disc with Nui's mask on it. Nokama saw a Kanoe mask niches in with the names of the other six Matoran. How is all that possible if they were not meant to be Toa? Ah, Vakama, your fire burns so bright, yet you remain so blind. The Kurzani chided. Makuta has his brother, and the Shattered One, his dark hunters. Has it never occurred to you that there are some in this vast universe who are sworn to the service of Matanui? And he alone. It was they who manufactured the evidence to help convince Makuta. And they did a masterful job, it seems. It made sense, and it was certainly easier to accept than the idea of Akmu as Toa. But one question still remained unanswered. How do you know all this, Kazani? The plant thing laughed as if at a private joke. Well, oh, one of those servants of Matinui's will happened to wander too close to one of my tunnels some time ago. He told me the whole story, all oh, that I have just told you before he died. A dozen more questions sprang to Vakama's mind. What was this mysterious order whose members apparently knew the will of Matanui? How many were there, and how long had they been in Metronui? Lekan had never spoken of them, nor had Turagaduma. Was it possible even they did not know this group existed? He wasn't going to get answers from the Karzani. A bolt of shadow came from above and struck the plant thing. Dead center, darkness spread like a plague down its vines and branches forming a chitinous shell that covered every inch of the plant. In a matter of moments, it was completely trapped inside, cut off from all heat and light. Vakawa looked up. Makuta was above staring down through the hole in the chamber ceiling. The breastplate of his armor was damaged, and greenish-black energy was leeching out of him. A faint wisp of shadow drifted from his open palm, the remnants of the power he used to fell Karzani. Come out, little Toa, Makuta said. If I have to come in after you, it will be most unpleasant. Vakama hurled a fireball, but not at Makuta. Instead, he threw it against a far wall, melting a hole in the stone. He jumped through the gap and found himself in an archives tunnel, one of several that stretched beneath Tametru. He ran then while behind him an angry Makuta smashed down what remained of the wall. Bolts of chain lightning flashed around Vakama as he hurtled through the narrow passages. He could hear Makuta's heavy tread behind him, coming nearer all the time. At some point, the Master of Shadows was going to catch up to him, and then what? As Karzani had said, he alone did not have the power to defeat Makuta. 
Then again, I'm not alone, he thought, looking at the mask of time he carried. If Makuta wants this mask so badly, maybe it's time to let him have it. Vakama climbed up the next access ladder he came to and emerged on a tall metro street near the protodermis reclamation yard. That, he decided, would make a perfect setting for his confrontation with Makuta. No allies, he told himself. No Kitangu, no of the Toa. Just me, Makuta, and this mask. Matanui altered the stars themselves to ensure I would become a Toa. It is time to show the great spirit he made the right decision. Makuta climbed the ladder slowly. He would never admit it to anyone else. But the Shadow One had wounded him far worse than any other being ever had. His Kanohi mask and armor held his dark energies in place. With his breastplate damaged, Precious' power was slipping away from him. But there was no time to make repairs, not with Vakama on the loose with the Mask of Time. He will give it to me willingly, or I will take it from his corpse. Makuta thought, in fact, I hope the fool tries to find. It will make my victory that much sweeter. Perhaps I will send his remains to the other Toa Metro, so that they may enjoy a few moments of fear before I destroy them too. He looked around, searching for signs of Akama. He had no doubt the Toa was hiding somewhere nearby, making some feeble plan for an ambush. Perhaps he was even thinking of using the Mask of Time again, not that that would do anything but buy him a couple more minutes of life. Show yourself, Toa! Makuta shouted, Give me the Mask of Time, and I will let you go on your way. I am sure your fellow heroes are missing you by now. The only answer was silence. In a strange way, that enraged Makuta more than open defiance would have. Why do you persist? The Master of Shadows continued. You will gain nothing from this but death, Fakama. Here, alone in this ruined city, there will be no one to mourn you here. No one to even notice your passing. You will not die a hero. Just a pathetic Matorn, playing at a role that was never meant for him. Why do you risk death? Why do you insist on opposing me? Vakama stepped out from an alleyway in the Protodermis Reclamation Yard, one hand hidden behind his back. Because I'm a Toa, he said, his voice strong and clear. And battling monsters is what I do. Makuta's smile was chilling. I, a monster? For knowing my spirit brother, Matinui, required a good long rest after his many labors, for offering my benevolent leadership to the Matoin in his absence, for his saving Matinui from the threat of Nidiki and Kraka. Vakama saw that Makuta was circling as he spoke, hoping to distract the Toa while he got into position to strike, but he wasn't dealing with a novice Toa Metru now. Yes, Makuta, said Vakama, the dark hunters you brought here and then murdered, just like you murdered Turaga Le Khan, and sentenced an entire city to a sleeping doom. Yes, I call you a monster, and worse. Makuta eyed his enemy, Vakama was standing next to a stopped conveyor belt upon which rested a line of damaged Kanohi masks. He was startled to see that the Vahi, 
intact was among them. And all that stood between him and one of the most powerful Kenobi mask in creation was one foolish Toa. Your words are like your powers, Vakama. Fiery, burnt in the end, meaningless, said the Master of Shadows. Now I will take that mask you so jealously guard. Makuta took a step forward. Vakama took his hand from behind his back, revealing that he held a Tomatorn's crafter's hammer. With blinding speed, he lashed out and smashed one of the damaged masks to fragments. Not just yet, said the Toa. How much do you know about the Mask of Time? Do you know, for example, that it still works even when damaged? I found that out the day I retrieved it from the ocean floor. Vakama smashed a damaged mask of water breathing. The merest crack and the power of time leaks out of it, affecting everything in the vicinity. The Toa fire continued. Isn't that fascinating? He shattered another mask, and then another. There was only two more between his hammer and the mask of time. Stop this childishness, Makuda hissed. You wouldn't destroy your greatest creation, mask maker. Yes, I suppose that would be hard to live with, Vakama said, smashing yet another mask. The sound echoed through the empty streets of Tan Metru. But then, if I were to shatter the Mask of Time, neither of us would be living the way we think of living. And neither will anyone else. Makuta watched him carefully, calculating odds. A rapid burst of shadow energy would destroy the hammer, as well as stun Vakama. But if he should miss... Explain, he said, edging closer to the Toa. Time, Makuta, Vakama replied as if speaking to a child. The force of time is contained within that mask. Destroy it, and that power is unleashed upon the universe. Past, present, and future all existing at once. Warps and rips and hours folding in upon each other. Madness and chaos as no two moments ever follow one another. Think of it. I am, said the armored figure. It sounds glorious. Really? Vakama said, shattering another mask into splinters. Imagine your body trapped between seconds, or half of your aging while the other half regresses. Does it still sound appealing to you? All of your plans and schemes will come to an end, because no matter what you attempted, I could walk into the past and undo it. Kill me today and I will be waiting for you in some tomorrow to avenge my death. Vakama's hammer hovered over the mask of time ready to strike. Think of it. Can you rule a future that is in the past, or a present that is still a century away? Could you ever be sure what you have done and what you haven't when months and years have merged together? Makuta pondered if Vakama was telling the truth. Destroying the Kanoe Valley would bring the universe to a crashing halt. Still, he could not believe that Toa would willingly visit such a fate upon the Batorn he had sworn to protect. Believe it, Vakama said as if he had read his mind. To save those I love from an eternity of your tyranny, I will end everything right now. Makuta looked into Vakama's eyes. They were the eyes of a being who had been driven beyond madness, only to return. They had looked upon a darkness as deep as any Makuta had known, and yet somehow turned back to the light. They were not the eyes of a being who was bluffing. What do you want? Toa, Makuta said finally. Save passage for Metinui for myself and this mask, Vakama said. Your pledge to not harm Kitangu, Tuagaduma, or the Rahaga, and to leave the Matoan in peace. Makuta took two quick steps forward, propelled by anger. It was only the sight of Vakama swinging the hammer that brought him up short. 
You ask me to sit in the darkness doing nothing, affecting nothing. The Master of Shadows snapped. You sentence me to a living death. And I say no. Go ahead, destroy the mask, and we will watch time and together. Vakama began to lower the hammer. Wait! Makuta cried. Vakama stopped, his hammer mere inches from the mask. Then what is your offer? The Toa asked calmly. I'd make it quick. My arm grows tired. The armored titan snarled. He was not used to negotiating with lesser beings, but there was one consolation. As long as the mask of time existed, it might still be his one day. Very well, he said. I will respect your allies here as long as they stay out of my way. I will even let you leave unharmed. And I will grant you one year of peace on the island above, and one year only. Then you will hear from me again. Fakama considered. He knew the other toy would never accept such a deal, simply because they would never believe Makuta would honor it. They would insist on battle, even Okama, to end his threat here and now despite the fact that such a battle would leave Metronui damaged beyond all hope of restoration. Do not try my patience, Makuta growled. Your own possession of the mask of time may leave me inclined to stay my hand, but we both know there are a thousand ways I could destroy you right now. And nine hundred and forty-one of them Vakama lowered his hammer and picked up the Mask of Time. How do I know you'll keep your word? Makuta smiled. You don't. But what is life without a little risk, Toa? Vakama was about to reply when the world vanished around him. The next moment, he was standing at the mouth of one of the tunnels that led to the island above. He still had the mask of time with him. Makuta has expelled me from my city, he thought. But we will make a new home above, Master of Shadows. One we will defend against you to the death. And one day, when you have finally been defeated... We will return to the City of Legends. This I vow in the name of all Toa and Matoan. End of chapter 9